I'm Patricia Ercolino, the producer of Sojourners Along the Way. And today I am very pleased to introduce our guest to you. In fact, I am honored to introduce this very prolific woman to you. And I told Bonnie that I'm just going to introduce her and then turn her loose because she has a wide variety of information to relate to you. I, I asked her to speak about her life and the things that have happened in her life that brought her to the place where she is today. So Bonnie Nelson is the president of Firestorm International Ministries, and she also has quite a variety of singing, and I hope you're going to tell us all about this, Bonnie. Well, I'm going to work at it. <laughs> Sometimes it takes me a little while to get going, but I've never been uh, told I didn't talk a lot, so <laughs> I think it's going to be okay. Uh, I'm just, uh, just thrilled to be here. I drove up from uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which is right outside of Nashville, where I moved many years ago to further my business to further my career in the music business, country music, is where I've been almost all my life. Okay. So it was kind of a wild ride. My uh, father was a Texan and he wanted to build a nightclub in Colorado where we were living at the time. So since I had a gift for singing and loved to sing, he was thinking about making a platform for me, which was just awesome. So he built a big now, supper club. I have to stop her okay. because she's starting midway. <laughs> You can't do that, Bonnie, okay. especially since I'm an educator, and I have my notes that tell uh -huh. me that as a young child, her family followed the thoroughbred horses, and she was in many schools, and coming from an educational background, I want to know how that impacted you, and, okay. you know, start, that's a good starting point, okay? Okay, all right, I'll go back <laughs> further, <laughs> go back into my childhood days. Yeah, go for it. Um, my folks had thoroughbred race horses, so we traveled every three months we would move because the circuit, you're on a circuit. So we would move all over the country and so I attended schools everywhere I would go would be um, getting to know somebody. So pretty soon when you, you just meet people all the time it's, it just becomes second nature. So I, I really don't meet any strangers. I feel like I know everybody when I meet them but we traveled and of course with horses I had a horse and so I became uh, real country. Yeah. And I studied under Guy Shelton, who, you don't know this, but Guy Shelton was a world champion calf roper and trick rider. So while I was at the racetrack, my dad hired him to train me a little bit. So I had training in being a calf roper and in trick riding. So I'd be going down through the shed rows of the track, practicing upside down on my horse <laughs> and stuff. So it was, it was pretty wild. But we did that in schools. And you also took schools. a number of titles. So I did. I, I, I was going to let you give the list. All right. Okay. Um, as I got a little bit older in high school, pretty much, I ended up in rodeo and being on the circuit, and that was just high school and um, Little Britches. I don't know if anybody remembers Little Britches Rodeo. I don't even know if they still do that, but I would compete in the queen contest and goat tying, in calf roping, barrel racing, and pole bending, a whole bunch of different things that they have and you compete. And I was very privileged uh, with a lot of hard work to take the title of uh, Miss Little Britches in 1967. And I also did some things, calf roping, I won the world championship title, which was like 5.6 seconds on two calves, because we didn't rope them and then throw them down. We just roped them and then when they hit the end of the, the rope, it snapped, it was called breakaway. Huh. So I did that, I was cutting horse champion and, and several other things. But uh, it was the horses and the music had to come into it because you had to have a talent when you ah. competed as a queen. Well, you had to have some sort of a talent and mine was singing. So I would sing and then we had to do certain things with our horses too. So that pretty well put me in, in the, uh, uh, a little bit of the music business and my dad saw that and, and he keyed on that. And uh, so then when he built the club, it was all, he used to take me around to clubs all over town and he'd, he'd get to the band and he'd say, I'll buy you guys a round of drinks if you get my daughter up to sing a couple songs. <laughs> so he would uh, make the way for me to practice, to learn, to, to get up there and get in training is really what I was doing. So then when he built the palace, then I had my first show in 1970 and it was a beautiful place. Anybody who came to Colorado came to the Country Palace to see our show. We had a dinner show. They had steak, lobster, prime rib and the biggest dance floor and even today I have people say I used to come to that club. It was so much fun. While at the club, uh, my singing partner and I, Bob Britton, won a talent contest which sent us to the Grand Ole Opry. So I came to Nashville my first time 
and we were, uh, my dad wanted me to cut an album, and so he was going to pay for it, but we were looking for songs, so we were listening to songwriters, and one of the guys, a little guy named Jimmy Bowen, said, I got a friend who has, uh, he's looking for a girl singer. So this is one of those fairy tale Hollywood stories that you just think can't happen. I was in Nashville for three days, and I uh, went to meet Kelso Hurston. Kelso Hurston was leading uh, the record company United Artist Records. And in three days, I had a major recording contract with United Artist Records and was scheduled to come back in a couple months to find material and then to record. And when we went into the studio, to tell you how green I was and how just a novice, we went in the studio and he said, I've got the Jordan Ayers to come sing back up with you. And I said, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and he said, you don't know who they are, do you? And I said, no. And he said, you will. <laughs> you will. So that was a real blessing. But uh, so that put me in the music business and mm -hmm. traveling. And Kelso Hurston was the one who uh, was also one of the biggest companies that did commercials. So he was doing commercials for international trucks. And they were looking for a girl. <laughs> and there I was. So that opened up another door of us to be able to uh, cut commercials. I auditioned. There were several women that were uh, tested for that. They had done it earlier, and it didn't work out, and so they were coming back. And so that put me in doing commercials for International Trucks, which opened up another thing. So and she became the United States Tokyo Rose. But it was called what? Transtar Rose. Yeah. They, uh, you remember when Tokyo Rose, when they had the war, and Tokyo Rose would intercept and in, get in the communications, and she would come on to the uh, people late at night, the soldiers, and start saying, oh, you really don't want to do this. And she had this really sweet, sexy voice. So they wanted to take that, uh, that symbol, that symbolic way that she was doing that, and parallel it, but they wanted me to speak about trucks and they had just introduced the International Transtar Eagle, a big truck that has been very successful for International Harvester. So we went in the studio, and International Harvester, you have to understand that at this time, they're a very conservative company. And they, in Chicago, Illinois, they have their office, and they are very traditional. And so they hired me to be more or less a sex symbol for the truck drivers. Now this is interesting because you've got International Harvester, very conservative, and you've got truckers. And so the truckers, truckers are like good old country boys. So I was to do commercials, so I would do a song, and then late at, uh, late at night, between 2.30 and 4.30, my commercials would be played all over the world on the major stations that listened to, for country music. So my country music career with United Artists Records was there, and now I had commercials, which gave me income. Mm -hmm. Because you don't really make that much on your records unless you write them. If you write the songs, you get royalties. So I auditioned for him. And so if, if you can picture back in about uh, this, this late 70s where the trucker is driving down the road and at 2.30 a song comes on and then some voice says, Hi, darling. <laughs> Did you think that your international sweetheart would forget you? Uh-uh. <laughs> Trans Star Rose wouldn't forget you. You double clutching devils. Oh, I know you're tired. You've had your pedal to the metal all night. But let me team you up with a truck that's got all the gut you'll ever need. I'm talking about my Trans Star Eagles. Engines to help you burn the breeze day and night like the little highway hustler you are. <laughs> so when you've got to make it in this tough world today, do it with me, Trans Star Rose, and one of my Trans Star Eagle trucks. <laughs> so the truckers going down the middle of the road going, what? What? So uh, I went to International Harvester and I asked him, I said, I really sense we could go out and do country music for the truck drivers and that this would be a really great advertising campaign. So they, uh, they started and they would get me a flatbed trailer and I would go at these truck stops and we'd set up sound and lights and all this kind of stuff and we would do truck shows. And they would bring in dealers from around the area with trucks. Well, it grew and pretty soon exploded. And the next thing I know, we have two customized. Now, International Harvester is known as being the corn binder. And they're a plain white truck. That was then. But with the International Harvester Transtar Rose tour, they started spicing up their trucks. They started really giving paint jobs to them. And they really started making a difference. And they were a dependable truck. So they had a cab over and a, uh, a conventional that they would bring in. And we had a stage that came down out of the truck. 
And so we would set up, and they would actually, we'd do a couple shows, and then in the middle, when we took an intermission, they would bring in the trucks from the other dealers, and they would actually sell trucks. So, I mean, there was, there was incredible things that happened, and it was just a fun time. It really mm -hmm. was. And we just, uh, we had a, a slide, or a, a, what do you call it, a screen up there, mm -hmm. too. It was, it was incredible what happened. They, we had up to 3,000 people coming into a truck stop where they were trying to catch me, and they would be lined up on the off-ramps. It was just incredible. And at the same time, Dave Dudley, of course, was doing truck shows, uh, truck driving, and trucks, uh, I think it was truck driving man, or keep on trucking. Jerry Reed was doing some things. There were a lot of people getting in, but they didn't touch the International Harvester <laughs> campaign. That was done by Young and Rubicam, and they did an excellent job. It was, and I loved it. And we're going to have to tell them that you just did a nice, great commercial for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was kind of like what we did. But um, you had to really hear it and understand what was happening to the truckers at that time. And, of course, country music was booming, yeah. just booming. And one time we were going to a, a WBAP down in Texas with Bill Mack, and they didn't want me to take my bus in the band. They said, we're just going to take you. I said, all right. So we get out of the road, and we, they broke down. The truck broke down. So they said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I don't know about you, but i, I got to be with Bill. I'm leaving. And so I flagged down this trucker. <laughs> and my secretary and I got up, and the international guy was going, like, what are you doing? I said, I've got to get to this show. This guy, this guy knew Bill Mack, and he knew what it was. And so he took me. But the funny thing was, was he was driving a Peterbilt. <laughs> so we had a ball with that, and his name was Big Daddy. I remember his handle. His name was Big Daddy. He was a friend of Bill Max, and he was hauling like 50,000 pounds of Kentucky Fried Biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> and he delivered Transtar Rose to the radio station. So it was just, there was just lots of fun and, and uh, great times we had. So. Yeah. I also asked Bonnie if she would be willing to sing some songs. So we're going to do a before <laughs> and, <laughs> and then an after. And she'll explain what that means also. So you ready to do a song? Uh, I think I got one for you uh, okay. from back in the days. So I'm having to do a little bit of, of manual work over here. But uh, when I was touring, I was also was recording for International Harvester country songs and also with United Artists Records. They were both working hand in hand. And so one of the videos that I put out was called Walking After Midnight, and everybody always loved Patsy Cline. So did I. She's one of the main reasons I got in the business. And uh, so when I did one of my uh, videos was called Walking After Midnight, and the Tennessee National Guard got involved with me, gave me a real plane, a C-110 or something. I mean, it was just incredible, the things we had. And it did make it on CMT for a while, but uh, it didn't make it up on the high high charts. But I but still. But you were it. on the charts, maybe. Oh yeah, I, I maybe had, we could I had do a, that. And you, had a you lot also of won a lot of contests, and you have titles and uh -huh. all kinds of things. So you want to sing the song so that yeah, way. Let me do uh, the, the Jake, song, and Jake can mute our. Right, so mute everything, <laughs> and I'm going to switch over to music. <laughs> all right, get ready. Memories. I'll go out walking after midnight Out in the moonlight Just like we used to do I'm always walking after midnight Searching for you I walk for miles all along the highways Well, that's just my way of saying I love you I'm always walking Always walking After midnight Searching for you I stop to see she that lied. weeping willow Crying on lied. his pillow Well maybe he's crying for me And as the stars go gloomy The night winds whisper to me Walking after midnight, out in the moonlight, just like we used to do. I'm always walking, always walking after midnight, searching for you. I stop to see she that weeping willow crying on his pillow. Well, maybe he's crying. As the stars go blue, the night winds whisper. 
Why Bonnie was the one that recorded 11 albums. I'm going to read this from my notes. Ooh. <laughs> Give you a little background Thank music. You. That would be nice, <laughs> but I don't know the song. At least I don't think I do. Um, Bonnie has recorded 11 albums, has done seven videos, and has 16 sing singles, several of which made it to the national charts and the National and Nashville <laughs> Network. Uh, Bonnie has also had contracts with Fredericks of Hollywood, <laughs> and the list goes on and on. But she also um, has traveled all over, all over the United States, Canada, and overseas, has performed from big time all the way down to county fairs, conventions, and package shows. Um, she was the opening act for Bob Hope, Vince Gill, the Oak Ridge Boys, Charlie Daniels, and is there anyone else? Because my, my thing goes, and the list goes oh, on. Was, there was just a lot of folks. Is uh, there anyone in particular that um, you would Ended up going overseas to fun? Germany to do some television programs with uh, Hank Williams, Drifting Cowboys, Christy Lane, John Conley. Uh, when you're in the, in the music business, when you're a girl singer and just coming up, they usually put you with a lot of guys. <laughs> so like Jerry Reed, I mean, Waylon Jennings. Um, we did a show in uh, Illinois State Fair with Willie Nelson. And there was this thing with uh, me with Willie Nelson because <clears throat> I'm a Nelson. Uh -huh. So they uh, thought sometimes that I was either his uh, sister, who was Bobby, or his uh, niece, Sherry, started singing. And we were all with uh, Buddy Lee Attractions at that time, and so they would get us mixed up. <laughs> and so sometimes I, I went into a place, and they'd, they'd say, well, you miss your dad? And I'd go like, well, yeah, yeah, I'm on the road a lot. And, and finally I'd figure out, uh-oh, they think I'm Willie's daughter. And so uh, we had to be kind of careful. <laughs> there was all kinds of wild stuff that would go on back then. It was a, it was a different time. It was uh, traveling in the, in the bus with five or six guys going all over the United States, all over the world. Um, it was a wonderful time. It was fun. And it gave me a lot of memories, a lot of things where a lot of people never had a chance to go out of their town. Mm. And I could travel across this country and I could see the grass, and I could see, like in North Dakota, all the sunflowers that were in miles of sunflowers, and I could see the water, the oceans on the sides, and the lakes, and the mountains, and I, I'm so thrilled with my country, and oh, yeah. so I have so much more to look back at, and uh, so I was blessed, and, and everything I was learning or going through at that time, I didn't realize, was for what was coming later in mm. my life. So it's, it's been an interesting ride, and it's not over. Oh, so. definitely. <clears throat> yeah. And, I, and Bob Hope was fun, too. He was one of those unique people. He just had a kind of an aura around him so that when you walked up, <clears throat> excuse me, he would, he would just, you, you didn't want to get too close. But he was always funny. And we were doing the show in Denver. And I said, well, I'll go on, because I was usually the opening act, because I didn't have the big hit record. And he said, oh, no, I'm not going on after some good-looking chick with the long <laughs> legs. He said, no, no. So he would, I always tell people he was my opening act. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was. So you're saying fun. after he went on. He went on before me. He opened up the crowd to me. Yeah? Yeah. So did he, he opened the show? Yes. Then you sang, and then he came back? Well, then we had another guy that went up, uh, Jimmy Swag, uh, I think, not Jimmy, <laughs> it was the gentleman that was the astronaut. He was on the show, too. It was a package show where there were several other uh, people that were speaking. So uh, it was an incredible um, night, evening, and it was just packed. The whole uh, Coliseum was just full, and so there was a, a really... Um, when you're on stage and you're performing, the audience gives. There's a, there's an electricity that comes to you as a performer. Mm. It was just magnetic. It was electrifying. Maybe that's the best word. It was electrifying. So that was good. And I'm going to show you. Let's see if I can get this on camera. Um, <laughs> at what point would something like this happen? If you can see it, can you can we zoom in on this? Uh, well, I'll just tell him what was going on, and maybe they'll have time to zoom in. The sheet. There he goes. He's trying to get that. All in. right. Um, the uh, 
usually as a performer you have an opening song that you go and it gets the crowd going and then at the end you always want to have your grand finale that's when it's whoa and I'm love my country and so I'm mom dad apple pie and my country so I had a song that was called America is and um, we had pyro fireworks so it was all during that last number and this was a song called America is and that was the closing number thanks guys that's great Matt and Jake, right? Yeah. They're here helping us, our studio guys. So that was a closing number, and I, I love my country. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I also love the fact that you went from this kind of fire, and later Bonnie's going to tell us about Firestorm. We'll just briefly introduce that during this program, and then we're going to do another program where Bonnie's going to tell a whole lot about Firestorm International Ministries. All right. So. Well, um, basically... My, everything started happening in my life. Like you'll hear a lot of people talking about my life fell apart. And my life started falling apart piece by piece. And I had always known there was a God. I just didn't know he was personal. So my brother was in a major plane crash and I went to Texas to be with him. And I had been just coming to the Lord. I had recently I'd been going across Kansas in my bus and and it was really big at that time about being born again born again and I was going like so what's what's up with the born again I mean I'm a real person so I'm not religious there's a difference in being religious and being spiritual so I, I went to my bass player and I didn't know he was a charismatic which means that he was really into the Lord big time and I said so what's this deal with born again what is this some sort of a fad or, or what's happening he said, no, it's real. He said, it's, it's, it's in the Bible. And so he got the Bible. So my drummer was driving, Mark was driving. And so Terry got me in the uh, middle of the bus. We had a kitchen area. So we're standing in the kitchen area. And he's got a Bible. And he's pointing me to the scripture saying, you're born again into Christ. And he said, do you believe in Jesus? And I said, well, yeah. He said, are you sorry for your sins? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, then you're born again. And I said, that's it? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, well, I don't have to walk on coals or anything? <laughs> and he said, no. And I said, well, do I get a certificate or something? He said, no. Because, <laughs> see, I have no clue what that meant. Okay. I did not understand a thing. You're looking at a person that met God. That day was in 1996 of my life. We had not gone to church before that. My grandmother was Church of Christ, and I remember her talking about the Lord. But I knew nothing. So I had to go study a little bit to find out what this was. And then when my brother was in the plane crash, I'd been studying a little bit to see what this was about, and I took a prayer cloth. I was in this church, took a prayer cloth, and the church was an experience for me, I'm going to tell you. Before you get there, Bonnie, okay. I, I have to have you rewind a little okay, bit here we to, go. <laughs> to 1991, because in my notes it says that your life began to fall apart. So you want, you so want what I, happened? I want, yes, I want you to tell people right. what happened that brought you to that point right. so they can really appreciate right. it. So my brother was in a major plane crash. But that was 96. What happened well, in 91? No, I was born again in 96. Oh, okay. Okay. So, oh, I see. What yeah, so he, he had this major plane crash, which is where I started calling out for God because they said he wasn't going to live. He had like 48 hours maybe to live. So... I went driving to Texas, going, oh, God, save my brother, save my brother. And, and he was burned. He, w he had planes, and he still has planes, but he had a, a jet MiG fighter plane. And he went to take off in Amarillo, and the uh, turbo engines failed. So in order to miss the houses, he banked the plane, and he was able to eject the, ca the canopy. But he went down. And so my nephew, who had usually doesn't stay when he takes off, was still there. So when he crashed, the plane was full of jet fuel. It had 750 gallons ah. of jet fuel, and it exploded. His suit failed. He wasn't wearing uh, the helmet. And so my brother, my nephew, pulled him from the plane. And it was so hot that his tennis shoes and his jacket melted. So my brother is, is burned, and there is a fire truck going by just going by it was checking plugs and they were able to get there there was an ambulance that was just five minutes away that had two burn specialists in it oh. and when he got to the hospital they life flighted him which usually would have taken 20 minutes it took him like 12 minutes to get there and there were doctors on staff that knew about burns so he is there uh, I'm driving to get there and I'm praying and um, 
as I come around a corner in Texas, it's probably two o'clock in the morning, and I come around a corner, and it was Groom, Texas. There's the biggest cross I've ever seen in my life, standing in the middle of a field, lit up. And I'm like, I'm having a vision. My God, <laughs> my God, what are you doing? And it, it, now I know that it's built, and it's saved a lot of people's lives. It's just a concrete, uh, it goes up like hundreds of feet. And people see it and have an experience like me. Well, I just knew it was God that was telling me it was going to be all right. They had construction in Amarillo, or uh, Houston is where it was, and so I had to go around the corner. I ended up at the exit where the hospital was. All kinds of things happened. I got in there, and the pastor of the, of the hospital was there, the staff uh, pastor. And I said, my going to be a you know, and he was like, calm down, calm down. <laughs> so he had two punctured lungs. Mm. His, he had been burned breathing in fire. His ears were the size this big. They were huge. His lips were huge. His whole head was bandaged. It was about this big because it was swelled. And they said, we don't know if you'll be able to talk. We don't know if you'll be able to. We don't know anything. Within 24 hours, the first lung healed itself. Wow. And they had tubes in his chest coming out to... Uh, to release the air because when your lungs are punctured, the air stays in your chest, so they were having to take the air out so he wouldn't literally blow up. They would have to take him in, and they did a chemical treatment for him, and they gave him uh, uh, morphine and stuff to put him in this tank, and they would dunk him with chemical treatments. And then when he came out, they'd give him sodium pentothal so he wouldn't remember because it was this pain. Hmm. So in three weeks, to the day, to the hour, my brother walked out of the hospital. Wow. A lot. Wow. And he, 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 his arms, they had him in these uh, ranger type, like Power Ranger suits that you see, <laughs> so that they would compress the skin. And they had, they had grafted skin off of his legs to go on his body. They'd also, in the first few days, taken skin off a dead person mm. to graft onto him. So I'm so thankful and I'm so grateful. And, and when you know God's done something like this your whole life, your, your focus, your vision, all of a sudden you see something different that comes in. So uh, that was just a testimony. And then he called me. He, he was going on a trip. Uh, about a year later to Austria because he was a referee and he pilot and he did all these things and he was going to witness with the church he was going with the church this is my brother from Texas and he was going to go witness uh, teach people how to play kids but he was also going to witness what happened to him and then the next time I called him he was talking he said I gotta go I'm in a hurry uh, we're baking cookies at the church <laughs> and I went like you're doing what and then I found out later he had met this little Oklahoma Texan, mm -hmm. a little lady, okay? Okay. And so she was Pentecostal. She had, had met the Lord when she was young. And he ended up marrying this woman. Her name is Vic, and I love her dearly. Aww, so my brother Nick sweet. and Vic was great. So that started things with me looking. And, and then the next thing was happened was that uh, I had my, my father got sick, and Kent's dad got sick. They both died. And then... It was my mother got sick with ovarian cancer, and that was like about a year or better that she dealt with that. And there were all kinds of things that happened. But one thing that was great, they thought her, they had it fixed. They thought they had. The doctor said, I think 95% we got it. With that 5%, you have to be careful. But in the midst, before this happened and it came back, a flyer came in the, in the mail. And it was about, it was called Praise Church. And I thought, well, let's go. So I told her, I said, Mom, we haven't been to church for 40 years. <laughs> My mom was 75. I said, let's go. And she said, well, I, I can't I'll wear a dress. I haven't <laughs> wore a dress in all that. I said, you don't have to wear a dress. So we went. My mom was wearing a of cowboy boots, a vest and jeans, and we went. And he preached, the pastor preached on uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. And when he said, I said, Lord, let this be a message. And he was preaching on that because my mom was in the fire. Mm -hmm. So uh, when he got done, he said that they usually say something like, raise your hands, Lord, or pray the last prayer. And her hands were straight up. They weren't just down. They were straight up. So I said, well, let's go tell the pastor he did good after the service. And she said, okay. So we walked up to this pastor who I've never met. And before I could really understand what I was saying, and you notice I talk a lot, <laughs> uh, I said, would you leave my mother in the born-again prayer? And that was not in my, my mind at all. And he said, well, I'll just stand with you, and you go. And I said, no, I, want, I need a professional. So 
at 75 years old, my mom was saved. Oh, she wow. accepted the Lord. And I know people don't understand that, but it's a spiritual thing to her that when you accept the Lord, you're saved and you're going to go to heaven at 75. So that was a great thrill in my life. Did that mean that she was not still dealing with things and that everything went just great? No. But it's for what's coming that I look forward to seeing her again. So, And then my relationship that I had, I'd been married once before for seven years, and then I had met this other gentleman, and we were together 26 years. And all of that started falling apart. We had a big home, 6,000 square foot home in uh, Tennessee. Everything just fell apart. It was just to the point where I ended up in my bus in a uh, campground in Nashville with a little poodle, and she died. So I was really, everything was just weird because I had gone to help my mom and dad, and so I'd left the career. And when I got back, I needed money, and the, the music business is like, can be cruel mm -hmm. because it's a time thing. It's a season thing. Uh, usually if you're 16 or 17, you're too old because they want to get people up and running. So that was kind of slanting off. So then I ended up in a warehouse working 12 hours a day at uh, trying to make my payments to just to survive. But in the meantime, God was coming into my life. And he sent me to a, uh, uh, what they call a spirit-filled church, a uh, deliverance church. And I knew nothing. And so a friend of mine would go, and we're sitting at the church, and all of a sudden... These people are all walking around in a circle. And I'm going, I ask questions. Do you ask questions? I ask questions. So I, I thought, well, so I got up, and I just got in line with them, and I'm walking around the church with them. And I said, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why are, are we, we doing, doing this? Why are we doing this? And I said, we're claiming this ground for the Lord. We're walking this ground and claiming it for the Lord. I thought, I can do that. The next thing that happened to me was somebody got what they call slain in the spirit, went down with the power of God. Some people have what we call a courtesy fall. <laughs> then that's kind of like, they just, anyway, we won't go there today. But So this so man, they, they fell, were one standing up and then And they, they were... prayed over this guy and he went down. And I'm going like, man down! We got a man down! <laughs> Call the medics! And they go like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. And I said, well, are you sure we shouldn't, can we just check a pulse? You know, shouldn't we just check for sure? So I, I have had a wild experience with God. <laughs> God has done some incredible things. He's, he's, he's still, I've never seen him per se. But it's just been exciting. And I, I, I see so many people that say, oh, that's just a bunch of junk. But I'm here to tell you, it is not junk. And I'm a real person. And I have a lot of questions. But I, I want answers. I'm not just going to say I don't need it because I do need it because he really came into my life in so many ways with my brother being alive and I'm alive. And what the world threw away, God said, hey. So things have changed like with Firestorm Ministry when you, when you talked about that. Uh, I started looking for God and I, I've my drummer or my bass player called me the one that said this is how you're born again mm -hmm. and he said in Huntsville 140 miles away from Nashville there's a bunch of prophets giving a word of God you want a word from God you can come down well I didn't know what a word from God was or a prophet but I wanted a word from God so I drove and they were doing prophetic training hmm. So instead of them telling me I had to go to seminary school, it was just a body of people that were teaching that cared enough to lift me up and say, come on up here and let's we'll show you. And they spoke over me and gave me a prophetic word, which I thought, what is that? Mm -hmm. Two hours they talked wow. over me. And I took the tape home and I wrote it all out. And I was, I was so confused. And, and, but it, I'm nosy. <laughs> so when you're confused and you're nosy, you go looking for answers. And I ended up in a ministry. I was going down there twice a week, so that was 280 Before miles. Before you go there. Uh-oh, oh, she's pulling me back. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But I also, okay. also want to ask, was there a song that we can put in here? Um, before you go on, because I know where you're heading. I'm, I don't want you to head there yet, Bobby. <laughs> okay, um, she's going to go over towards Firestorm, right? Yes, I was. I was yeah, about no, to you're not allowed to do that. I, right, I have well, to keep you in suspense a little bit longer, and I want to show you these things I have on the, on the desk over uh, here. In fact, I'll go ahead while you're doing that. This is, let me see which one. I, that's this one. Bonnie came out with, after... Um, coming to the Lord. She has done a few CDs. 
This one is called um, God, and God, country. And God and Country. And she also did another one called It's a God Thing. And I think it would be fun to hear some of the stories behind these. <laughs> okay? So you sing, and then you can tell a story. All right. Um, I'm going to switch over to the other mic, talking on this one first, because the singing has a little bit of reverb on it, so it makes it a little bit better. Okay. But the, the thing that God did to me was that he just, he, everything that I learned in the music business, he's using now. It's not over. And I, I've really been fighting that because I didn't want to say I was uh, trying to use my music talents or something and be an, a country music singer in the music business. So I started learning a bunch of songs that were like what they were singing in the church. And then recently, God has been bringing me back into country, the vein. So I wanted to give you a sample of some of the things that I've been doing um, in Firestorm because it's still me. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of gotten with people saying, well, you're just an entertainer, you're not a worship leader, and you don't do music, blah, 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 blah. They'll, your friends sometimes hurt you. Yes. So this was kind of a fun song that I was just started singing, and see uh, what you think of this. tell you a story it's the one I love to tell from the Bible Paul and Silas thrown in jail even in that prison well they knew someone was there so they never gave up no they never gave up on God no no they said we'll just start to praise him when we do it once, well, we'll do it again. We'll just keep on praising till the shackles come off. Keep on praising till the shackles come off. Praise Him in the midnight hour. Praise Him for His mighty power. Praise Him when your heart is broken. Praise Him when the prison doors open. Just when you think, you think it's enough. You think it's enough, you gotta keep on praising Keep on praising till the shackles come off Keep on praising till the shackles come off Oh, get on it Now when your life seems hopeless And everything goes wrong Locked up in a prison of your own there's a light at the end of the tunnel No matter what you're going through So don't ever give up, no, don't ever give up on God no. Now just begin to praise Him When you do it once, well you do it again You gotta keep on praising until the shackles come off Keep on praising until the shackles come off Praise Him in the midnight hour Praise Him for His mighty power Praise Him when your heart is broken Praise Him when the prison doors open Just when you think, just when you think You've worshipped Him enough You gotta keep on praising until the shackles come off Keep on praising until the shackles come off Praise Him in the midnight hour Praise Him with His mighty power Praise Him when the prison doors open Praise Him when your heart is broken Just when you think, think it's enough You think it's enough whoa, whoa. You gotta keep on praise until the shackles come off 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 <laughs> <laughs> now, Bonnie, before, All right. <laughs> um, before you go any further, yeah. I would like to offer you some contact information on how you can get in touch with Bonnie. And I'm going to spell her email address. That's her first name, Bonnie, B-O-N-N-I-E-N-E-L-P, which stands for Nelson and Productions, but it's B-O-N-N-I-E-N-E-L-P at A-O-L dot com. Whew, you go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> uh, I would love, I would love. In fact, I've asked Bonnie if she would. We can do a total of like three programs so we can have one where she just goes whole at it singing. Uh-oh. <laughs> Lots of songs, yeah. Yeah, so I asked her to bring a bunch of songs with her. She has, I, I've called her prolific because she's multi-talented. Multi-talented. <laughs> not only is she a singer, not only is she the president of Firestorm Minis International Ministries, but she has also done some writing. I have a couple of her things here. This is the women in the church. I hope it's all encouraging. It Telling women you can do it. Maybe you can talk to us a little <laughs> bit about that because I really want to encourage women. I do. This one's called God's Oils. And Bonnie has a story about how she actually <laughs> came up, and I'll have to show this later, but this is an oil blend that Bonnie came up with, Lady Lady. See, she's prolific. She does a lot of stuff. And it's an interesting story behind that. And then this is the cremation, cremation issue revealed. So we're not going to have time to talk about all of those things, but I would like you to talk about a few of them, oh, all right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, I get to choose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted to ask you if you want to pick up some place where where we were before you sang this song. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, maybe how about tell us a little bit about your book, which I ah. don't have a copy of. I know, bad girl, bad girl. But no, I'll make sure that okay. you get one so you can see it. I wrote a book called "It's Not Luck, It's God," because a lot of people give credit to uh, things that happen in their life as being lucky, hmm. and I don't anymore because I know the difference I know that it's the Lord so as I was learning all this stuff and I didn't know a lot of stuff I think God was doing a cram course with me like college so I'm in the bus in the campground and I start writing about things that are happening to me because when you go through something I've always shared Firestorm ministry all the books that you see are a result of me sharing teachings on the ministry with people so as I was learning things I was writing it down it was a year and I would sometimes start writing uh, in the morning, and then the next morning I would say, i got to quit, Lord. i just got to quit because the sun was coming up, and I would still be there in the front. I'd have papers everywhere. I had my IBM Selectric typewriter because we didn't have computers then. And so I, it just kept going, and I remember my friend Jim Millard said, how long is this book going to go? And I said, I don't know because it ended up being quite long because of all the things I was going through. So I wrote the book to help people, and I have a lot of fan club members that bought the book, uh, and they would say, I have it next to my Bible because it explains things. Because sometimes uh, pastors don't have time to explain a lot of things that are happening. So with uh, my, uh, one of my pastors had a daughter that had a, a necklace and she wouldn't take the necklace off. So he started talking about that it was, it was a cross, hmm. but it had a little flip on the top of it. It was called, what's we call an anka, an A-N-K-H. And I didn't know what that was, but he said she was drawn to that necklace and she wouldn't take it off. And the cross with the, the Anketh cross is not God's cross. Mm. So what happened was it was something that was from, that was not holy. It was not godly. It looked like it, but it was not. So he prayed over it and uh, said some things and it caught my ear and my attention. And he said about two weeks later she wasn't wearing it. He said, where's the necklace? She saw it was around here somewhere. So certain things, uh, for instance, if you had a, a, a satanic Bible in your house, you would know that that should if there's any spirits running around anywhere, they might like to come in and visit you because you have stuff that belongs to the other kingdom. I don't like to have stuff that belongs to another kingdom in my house, so I'm real careful. And uh, so I learned about that and I started studying. So that was one of the chapters was about the occult and how to help your kids or you if you're having a lot of troubles because we have uh, people that are having a lot of supernatural things happening right now and they're not all bad, but we need to be careful in our world today. There's, uh, in my city I live, they have like about, they had 16 witches covens, actual covens mm. of witches, which you don't think That's happens nowadays, no, we that do. are in our town, and so I wanted to know what was going on with that, and how that affected me and my family. So uh, th that was why I wrote the book. I wrote the book to share what was happening to me, and at the time, every time I had to go learn, see, God was teaching me. He was teaching about His kingdom. Mm -hmm. So training comes in many forms. It, he didn't send me to a seminary. He gave me life experiences so that when I talk about something, I can be real to you 
because it happened and I know what I had to do to get rid of it. So that was where the book came from. And I've probably given away more copies than I've sold. <laughs> so it was not something that God had me do. And it, it's one of those things where you just knew sometimes God will ask you to do something in your life and until you do that, you don't get to go on. You kind of have to, I'll do that and then, okay, now what, Lord? Seasons. Okay. Seasons. Now, did you finish telling the story about how you became a Christian? Because um, I know... I kind of pulled you back one time because you were ready to go there. And it's like, no, buddy, you can't go there yet because you didn't tell us all these other things that had happened that led up to that. And then you started again. And I was like, okay, Bonnie, let's interject a nice song here. Yeah. So okay. I want to make sure that, you know, you wanted, uh, you had the opportunity to give My all, all the information that you would like. When I officially became a Christian was in my bus going across Kansas somewhere. Don't remember the day. I just remember it was 1996. At that point, my life started shifting. And there were opportunities. Since I didn't know that my bass player was a charismatic Christian, his, his mom had been one too, I didn't know that my piano player had gone to seminary school. And uh, I didn't know that my drummer had also done that. I was surrounded <laughs> and had no clue. After all this started happening to me, it was like all of us suddenly got touched. I don't know whether it was we were going down the, in the road in the bus and something just went zap. You know, that God just said, bam, and we all got hit. But we all ended up going into these prophetic groups and learning more about God and learning about the prophetic ministry. And Can you explain what that means? The prophetic what is ministry the prophetic? is hearing the, the voice of God. You all hear it. The, the Bible says that Jesus hears, that Jesus knows his sheep and that his sheep hear his voice, but we always think it's us. You have that little voice in your head? That's basically when, how God can talk to you. So when I allowed the Lord to come into my spirit, there's the saying that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden when they ate, that they lost their connection, their, their verbal connection with the Lord. They lost that, the ability to hear. Their spirit died. So when we're born, our spirit is there. It's just not alive. So when I accepted the Lord, zap! The Holy Spirit came into my spirit and sealed me. So what my spirit mean? sealed means that just what it says, that the Spirit of God entered to me, my spirit. It woke up my spirit. It gave me new life. I was born again. Born again into what? I was born again into Jesus. Because Jesus, when he died and he, came, he was resurrected, he came back. That means he was resurrected. He was born again. But he had... He came back and he could eat and he drank and he touched people, but he walked through walls. So he had a glorified body, which is where we're hoping we're going. Please, Lord, don't leave me here. <laughs> so my spirit was born again. It woke up. My spiritual part. My, I believe that there's three parts to us. Okay. We have our body, which is this, this is our house. This is where we live in. I have a soul, and that soul is my mind, my will, and my emotions. Yeah. Feelings, nothing more <laughs> feelings. So those three things are in my soul realm. And then I have a spirit. Because when we go look at someone when they die, their body is still there. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing to touch. There's nothing living. So the soul and the spirit are the two parts that bring the life to the body. So when he sealed my spirit, what I mean by that is the Holy Spirit, he did just like, have you ever seen anybody do canning? Mm -hmm. You know how they can vegetables and stuff? And they put that seal on the top? He sealed me. I'm his. My spirit is sealed. But this little body and this little soul realm, my mind, my will and emotions, listen, this is a strong-willed woman <laughs> sitting here. I do a lot of things. So it's learning how God talks in the Bible about things I'm supposed to do. So when I say I'm born again, I got born again into Christ. My little message here, I was born again into Christ. And um, I didn't really feel anything. I didn't know anything, but now as I study and I learn more and more, I learn so much about what Jesus did. And uh, I did a teaching on Firestorm one time, and I was teaching about <laughs> the Word of God. And, and I was sitting there one day, and the Lord, I just I heard. I don't pull you back. Yeah, okay, well, hang on. Wait, wait, let me see. This is really good. This is really good. I was sitting there, and the Lord said to me, and I heard my own voice say, do you know my name? And I went like, well, I think I know your name, Lord. And then I went studying, and you know, I did not know his name. Because his real name, like my real name is Benita Ray. But everybody calls me Bonnie. That's a nickname. Jesus' real name was Yeshua. 
Yeshua could not be translated down into the languages, the Greek and the Latin, because of the vowels and everything. So they came up with, uh, they went to all these different Iusus and everything, and they ended up with Jesus. So when I started teaching that, because it says in the Bible, everything by my name you say, I want to make sure i got the right name. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Because, see, I'm weird. I, I'm just, well, that seems logical. So when my dad would get, wanted to call me and get my attention, but they were right. <laughs> it wasn't mine. So when I get in trouble, it's Yeshua. Yeshua. <laughs> so when I taught that, people got so mad at me. They said I was trying to take Jesus away from them, and all this thing blew up. Mm. And so uh, now what do you hear? Everywhere you go, the first, first thing said in the Passion movie was the devil says to Jesus, Who are you, and what is your name? I lost it. I cried all the way through the movie because it was God talking to me. So I, I'm a little different. I'm, I'm not religious. I love the Lord, and I love to give people answers about what's happening. Relationship. So yeah. prophetic is hearing that voice in your spirit. And you know the one that says you'll never be anything. You're going to die. You're nothing. Whose voice is that? That's an evil voice. That's mm -hmm. the devil. Like those little the angel on one shoulder and the uh, devil on the other. So you know that that's not God. Because the Holy Spirit says, come on, get back up. You can do it. It's okay. I'm going to make the way. Come on, let's go. He's the encourager. He's the comforter. And the other little voice sometimes is like, I'm not doing it. That's me. <laughs> That's my little soul here going, no. <laughs> Stubborn, things like that. So anyway, okay. <laughs> Does that lead into a, another song? Yes, I just happen to have a song. <laughs> Good. And this one really fits in for that one, too. Good, I thought so. So you, you, you could feel those vibes, right? I could. All right, this one is, is kind of a, a neat little song that uh, talks about what I've just been talking about. Good. Is that good? Yes, excellent. I don't have it all together Sometimes I find myself asking why or oh why But I know we don't have forever So I'd be a fool to let this moment pass us by At the risk of sounding crazy Let me ask you if you died tonight, where would you be? Where would your soul spend eternity? Jesus gave his life. If you just believe, it changes everything. If you die tonight, you can call me narrow-minded. I believe down in your heart there lies the truth And if you look down deep you'll find it An empty place that's pointing to the truth You can hear his voice inside you Gently asking If you die tonight, oh, where would you be? Where would your soul spend eternity? Jesus gave his life. If you just believe, it changes everything. If you die tonight, say I need you. I can't live without you. Come and fill my life with your glory, God. Say, I need you. I can't live without you. Come and fill my life with your glory. Say, I need you. I can't live without you. Come and fill my life with your glory. Oh, say, I need you. I can't live without you Come and fill my life With your glory So if you die tonight Where would you be? Where would your soul Spend eternity? 
Wow. Where would you be? Yeah. If you don't know, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> we only have a few more minutes. Oh! I, I want to add to what Bonnie was just saying, singing in that song. Uh, it, it touched my heart oh. because it made me think about all these people that don't know the true God. They've heard bad stuff about God. They don't want to have anything to do with God. They equate the church to God. And sometimes churches make mistakes, and they're wrong. That's not who God is. That's not no. the God of the Bible. If you were to die tonight, where would you go? There are only two places. You either get to go to heaven or you get to go to hell. And I don't want anybody to go to yeah. hell. I want everybody to go to heaven. Can so, I intercede the point here? Of course. Um, when my mom was dealing with ovarian cancer and I got there, there were all kinds of things and she said this to me. She said, why is God punishing me? And it just made my heart break. And I said to her this, I said, you do know there are two spiritual realms and there's another guy here, don't you? There's somebody else at work and he loves to imitate God because I tell you today that God is for you, not against you. Sometime in your life you'll have to make that decision that you're either going to believe that God is good and for you or he's not. I want to encourage you to go after God. He's the one that's for you. He's for you. And I think that's a great place for us to be wrapping up this program. Um, Bonnie is going to do a second program with us, and that's where you can cut <laughs> loose on Firestorm and what Firestorm is. And hopefully we can talk a little bit more. A little bit more. You didn't even get to talk about these things that are sitting on this desk. <laughs> but um, I hope you have enjoyed our program today. In 30 seconds then, how about if we both just say, Jesus loves you. Jesus does love you. And, and come see me at Firestorm Ministries yeah. because I'm online. Our ministry is without walls and it's www.firestormministry.com. Look for me on the front page. If you don't know about God, we teach people how to hear the voice of God for themselves. Come see us. And I'll say amen. <laughs> <laughs>